How are you? How are you? I take it that was a... You were taking Rabbit a piss, you were taking a piss no, royally no, no, there, no, were no, you? No, 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 that was beautiful. It was a, you weren't watching? No, we're just... No, I think I'll miss that. The height of it. Do you want to see? Not really, no. Okay. Was it p perm? There was a perm, yeah. There was a tash. Uh, there yeah. weren't a lot of clothes in some of them. I think once more for the road. Can we have a look? Oh, there. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. That's, that's not all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. That, that was Explain a gig. Explain that. Explain yeah. that. Wow. Yeah, that, is, that is a heck of a jacket. Uh, so everyone's welcome to the uh, Graeme Souness retirement tour. Yeah. I um, have to say, I've never been a sub before. This is... Um, <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm only a stand-in, so I'm sorry for the ones who are expecting Merce. But um, I love coming to Dublin. Yeah. Can I tell you a story? You know, I've got... My wife's family are all from Dublin. And um, my mother-in-law is a cousin of Dickie Rock. Have I ever have I, I mean, yeah, I've told yeah. you that before? Yeah. So um, I'm, um, I always feel great when I come back here. And that's coming from a range, the only Rangers manager that's ever said that. Ex-Rangers manager. <laughs> 15 years at Sky brought to an end on Sunday. Yep. How did that come about? Well, you know, you get a feeling that, you know, things are changing. So I've known for maybe six months that um, I wasn't going to get my contract renewed. And I'm completely cool with that. Yeah, what would normally happen... It, at Sky, they signed a three-year deal with the Premier League, and then the pundits would be offered a three-year deal. So last time I got a year, and I thought, well, that's me up. that takes me up to 70, and I'm completely cool with that. And then you think I'll be ready to retire, and then when you get to nearly 70, you think, you know, I still, I'm still enjoying it, I still fancy it. So I was, I was disappointed, but understand, they've gone in a very different direction, and I, the way I look at it, and I've been saying this for a long, long time, you know, I'm, I'm, my, it's my birthday on 70, uh, on Saturday I'm 70, and from the age of, what it means for me, they, from the age of 15 to 70, I've had wages out of football. Now, I played with great football players who, when they got to 32, 33, and they finished, that was it for them. So I'm one, I'm one of the lucky ones. I've been really, really, really lucky. And, and I feel great, uh, I've still got lots of energy, and I want to continue working, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ready to retire yet. I, I think I enjoy being taken out of my comfort zone on a regular basis. And I think if I've always uh, used the, the thought where if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And I, you know, I push myself in everything I do. I always have done, and, and I've been lucky in so many, many ways. And this is another, another aspect. You know, I, I, I never went looking for management. You know, what it means is I played 20 years with a crossover into managing and playing. Coached for 20 years with a crossover from playing into management to the punditry. So it works out, I've done sort of nigh on 20 years in the three of them. And I've been, I've been so lucky, very, very lucky. Punditry has changed dramatically over those 15 years. Mm. You talk about the way it is going what was it that you felt actually Sky's moving in a different direction? Your voice maybe wasn't, I don't want to say as relevant as it once was, but actually... No, I don't, I don't think that. I just think there's um, obviously more ladies involved now. Um, they're looking for diversity. I still think, I, I think because of what I've won in the game and what I've done in the game, you know, I think um, I'm entitled to my opinion and I think people still listen to it. And... Listen, I would have worked as long as they wanted me, I suppose. If they, had, if they had said to me, we'll give you another year, I would say, okay, we'll see where we are in a year, but I would have taken it. It wasn't to be their call. Because it's not an easy gig. Like, I found it easy. Did you? Yeah, I really did. I, I, I got it. The live television you know, puts you on the edge. You know, you know you're, you're only ever one send us away from never being asked back. So... And I've come close to that more than one occasion. <laughs> but I, I, I really enjoyed it. And, I, and it's like my old mate, and I found it really surprising given his, his personality, Alan Hansen. I spoke to him many years about it, and he was doing it for years with the BBC. He said he used to feel physically sick before he, was, before he went on air. And I, 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 I just think, it's a giggle. You're with like-minded people. 
Um, you don't always agree when you're doing the punditry, and that's the way it should be. Uh, and I'm just, uh, I was back amongst footballers, and I enjoy that company, because that's been my world for a long time, well, forever. It's interesting. It does seem as if maybe 10, 15 years ago, the really heated arguments were the preserve of Irish television, and you mm. experienced some of that. And we used to look at Sky in the days, uh, Keys and Grey, and Match of the Day, and, and didn't, it didn't have the same bite. And you fast forward 15 years, in some ways it's actually a bit tamer over here now, and Sky seems to have just taken a rocket ship. I don't know, was social media driving it, or was there like a concerted discussion, let's try and rev it up a bit, but last couple of years, a lot of arguments, a lot of big moments. Yeah, I think if you look at all media, that's how it's gone. You know, from the newspapers to radio to phone-ins to what we do, uh, I think it has gone to another level. But there's so much interest in football now. I mean, I, I, um, I played on a team that we were arguably the best team around. And when I say around, not just in Merseyside, we were the best team around. And we never got anything like the coverage that very ordinary teams get today. Mm. I mean, there's players who play for Bournemouth, where I live, you know, are stars. Um, can't go anywhere. And, uh, <laughs> and I... <laughs> and I you approve of that, clearly. <laughs> and I, well, I, I, was, I, was, I told the guys um, off here, I've been in Bournemouth for 13 years. When I first went there, the players were driving around in second-hand three-series BMWs. Now they drive around in Ferraris and Lamborghinis. And the, the whole thing has just gone completely the other way. And I feel sorry for some of my teammates that were world-class footballers that don't have a great deal. Sure. And, you know, and I'm, as I said, I'm lucky I've... I've um, continue to earn money out of football-related business. Um, and my mates, who, who were genuine, genuine world-class players, my definition, definition of a world-class player is someone who can go anywhere and get in anyone's team. Mm. And I played with a lot of them over my, my years at Liverpool. You, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not a man to be perusing social media too often, are you? No, I, I tell you what I'm doing. Um, I'm, actually, I'm about to go on... I think it's Instagram, but, if, <laughs> so, so that's a but, no. but it's for a reason. I'm, okay. involved, I'm, I'm heavily involved in a charity, and um, it's to promote that. I'm doing, I'm, oh, it sounds really serious, but on the 22nd of May, I'm on BBC Breakfast, I'm announcing the maddest thing I've ever done in my life okay. to try to bring awareness and raise a few quid for the charity I'm involved in. So 22nd of May, so I'm going on the Instagram just to, to promote it, really. Fair enough. The reason I ask is, I, I was curious as to what your sense is. It strikes me now when a row is brewing in a Sky studio that all the pundits are aware, this is going to get 20 million views, and I better be bloody sure I don't lose this row. And it, it, it's almost, it's in the ether. I don't I know if you I can never remember that. losing one. <laughs> 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 I, um, I work with people, and it's, I, I, this, this is not a criticism, but it's just the, the way our world is gone. You know, in between, you, you do your segment and then it goes to, goes to break. The first thing a lot of the guys do is pick up and see what people are saying about them. Well, I, I'm fortunate throughout my life, I've never really bothered too much what people have said about me. Mm. Um, but I, I understand that social media and that's the way the world works now for... Yeah. And I, I'm an old fart, I'm 70 years old. Who's 70 in the room? You feel left behind at all? Would you like to go and would you like to be young today? I would for the lady aspect, but nothing. <laughs> nothing else. Nothing else. And we, it's, it's, I can't tell. I, I, I say this, especially when I've had a, I'd love to go and do it all again. You know, I, of course I made mistakes. You know, no one gets the outrage, doesn't make mistakes. But I've, I've had the most incredible run. Hmm. I really have. Well, as a last time um, word on the punditry, let's just remind you of one of the good old days, so mm. Arsene Wenger, things aren't going well, and there's a discussion on back on RTE. All right, Last listen, year. hang on a second. On a minute, Can we no, forget about is... the money for, no, for one second? No, because the money's What does really he need? I, I, I can't no answer that hang question. Hang on a second. If he doesn't have the money, what I said to you before, you if he has the money, he needs 100 million, that's what he needs. But now, I... if he can't keep Flamini last year, and that was through wages, I, I, right. I, I would say it differently. Well, why did he let him go? I would then? say he's got Danielson, he's got Song, he's got Najri, he's got Fabregas. He saw them as better players. 
Who was selling these better players? No, he saw them as better right. players. Than Flamini. Flamini. Yeah. Different types Flamini of players. was in the team all the time. Yeah, well, Denny is a sitting player. No, he's not. Flamini's a sitting player. No. Denny's a sitting player. Flamini was outside. He saw he had young good players. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I mean, Flamini was a talking about. Where did you manage? I didn't manage anywhere. I managed to stay alive for six and a half years. We're going to need it there for the time being. We're going to take a commercial. Oh, yeah. I can't. I can't tell you how much fun Eamon is to work with. He's an absolute rascal. He sits there with a hand grenade, and every time there's a, there's a lull in the conversation, he just gets one out and lobs it in. They, they, they were really good days. And, I, and I'd been doing punditry for a while, mm. but when I came here to work with those guys, I learned something again. I, really, I, I learned from them. Yeah. Did it dramatically change your punditry when you went back to England? Well, I think the difference, it was more fierce here, as you said earlier. And I think that was because in England, Sky have to send a reporter two or three days a week to the training room to try and get an interview. And if Sky were caning Premier League players like the guys here did, I'm not sure if it'd be too welcome at training grounds. So I think that was the obvious difference. But I, I did, I loved coming here and I loved working with those. They were, it was um, edgy, <laughs> to the least. It and is he, interesting. He's an absolute rascal, Dumphy. What a rascal. <laughs> It is interesting there that you're analysing Arsenal and you're going through their midfielders and you had great knowledge of that. It does feel, watching in recent years, that they very much lean into you as your former Liverpool player. So we want you to talk about Liverpool 95% of the time. And when we look back at Liverpool Manchester United a month ago, it's you and Carragher on one side of the studio. It's Keenan Neville on the other side of the studio. A have you found that as well, that it's, it's not a case of you just analysing football? It's, we want your Liverpool taken automatically. You can't like Manchester United, so you're going to hammer them at every opportunity? I, 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 I would... I know that, listen, if you're a football supporter, you know, and someone says, if I, if I say anything about Man United, it's because I'm anti-Man United. I am not anti-Man United. There's been a lot to criticise United for in, in recent times. But when Fergie was manager and they were flying, I was very complimentary. I'd, I would hate to be remembered for that, that, you know, they got me there just to say nice things about Liverpool because I've been critical of Liverpool. And, I'd, and like, now I don't think Liverpool are right. I don't think they're far away. I think it's a midfield's an issue, but um, no, I'd hate to be remembered for someone who just, what well, was, you're, you're saying biased. I don't, I, I don't think I am that. Mm. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm certainly not accusing you of uh, bias. I'm wondering if the production around it is leaning more into that. Possibly, yeah, possibly. Um, but it, it comes back to um, what makes good television? Mm. Mm. You know, that people having an argument. You know, people disagreeing. They don't want, you know, three or four nodding donkeys there just all saying the same thing and agreeing with each other. So I suppose that confrontation is something that they would, they would try and um, make happen on a regular basis. And they would deem that good television. You mentioned 70 on Saturday. Happy birthday. Do you contemplate your mortality? Do you start thinking about things in that way as you get older? Um... No, I, I, I um, without getting too heavy, I had open heart surgery when I was 38. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I got an infection after the first time, 10 days after having the first operation. They had to open me up again, and I've been in the intensive care unit. The only person in there with the night light looking at the clock thinking, don't go to sleep, this is how you fucking die. So I, I've, listen, I don't, do I think about it? I've got six kids. Uh, my youngest is 23, so I want to try and be around a wee bit more. I don't, it's not something I worry about. Yeah. Because... You know, my, my, my parents didn't live very long, and um, you know, I know how much I miss them, so I want to show and be around for, for my kids. Because you seem in like incredible shape, and you've really looked after yourself, and even uh, you took everybody's surprise a couple of years ago when you said you'd turned vegan as well. I know maybe you didn't say that was necessarily health as much as animal cruelty, but you do seem like, Jesus, a 70 year old goes, you're in amazing shape. Is that a legacy of what happened at 38? Say that again, what happens at 38? That very serious operation at 38, did that change? Is that one of the reasons no, maybe you're so no, healthy? No, 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 I, I, I do the exact same things now as I did before the operation. Right. There wasn't anything I did other than just the wrong genes. I, I, I work, I enjoy, I think the best way to say, I've got some gym equipment at home, and when I tell people that, oh, I, I couldn't do that, I need to be in an environment where I'm with a trainer or in a group. For me, it's perfect. I'd much prefer, I love just challenging myself so I can get in, the, in there and just 
and I'm honest with myself, I know when I'm pushing it, pushing it. And, I've, and I've, I'm a swimmer as well, where I live, uh, I, I swim, and that's, that's just the most fantastic sensation. We get up, I swim with some guys who are still working, so we're in the sea at 6.30 in the morning, four times a week, all weathers. And I just, I just get such a buzz out of it. Okay. Anderson's get the top off again. <laughs> <laughs> But when I rang him yesterday uh, to give him plenty of notice about, uh, about this show, he was, he was on the golf course and he'd be just out of the water, so oh, yeah. I think you're living an all right life. Yeah, you're doing oh, no, just fine. It's, it's good, it's good. I cannot complain. And um, as I say, I've got six kids. And have you seen a picture of my wife? <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am definitely punching. <laughs> um, on the, the heart surgery, I just happened to read a piece and, from a couple of years ago, and it was interesting. You were saying that for a time after, I don't know how long after, but psychologically you're vulnerable after an operation like that, and you would find you could just have tears roll down your face. Yeah, I, no one said it, and, and it's only when you ask the question afterwards that, that, that it's a common yeah. thing that happens. That, you know, had the operation, and then within, say, the following month, six weeks, two months, I can't remember, it was a long time ago. But for no reason, I'd be sitting there and tears would start coming down my face, just, but happy to admit it, because it's, you know, we're all, we've all got our vulnerabilities, but I don't know, it's just your, you know, there's an element that when it happened to me, for me anyway, at, at 38, I'm thinking, why has it happened to me at 38? You know, I never, I was never ill. <laughs> I was never ill. I just went in for a, an ECG and then they said something going on and I went for an angiogram which is where they go into the groin and they came out with three arteries that needed repairing and I thought let's go for it that was on the Thursday and on the Tuesday I was operated on and um, touch wood I'm you know feel Fine. great yeah feel great because I guess it is hard as well to get that balance in that you're one of the lucky ones they spotted this at 38 you were able to go in and have the oh. operation Rather than, you know, as you say, it's genetic, anything can happen five years later. No, but it's completely, and, and, and I'll talk about it because it will affect some people in this room. You know, I, I was training, I was 38 years old, training every day with the, with the players. Um, no shortness of breath, no pains, nothing. Um, and I just went, I wasn't sleeping, and I went for a, the CCG, you know, you've got the monitors on, the stickers on, and... They said, yeah, there might be something going on, but have an ECG, and I'm sure it'll clear up. The ECG showed it had, um, sorry, that was ECG, the angiogram showed up, I had three arteries blocked. Now, at that time, I could have just parked it. And if I had my time again, I would, because I had no symptoms, no pain, no, nothing running upstairs. I was playing five sides. I was doing lots of, you know, physical endurance stuff. And then... Because of my family history and because of the job I did, I had two uncles in their 30s died with heart, heart issues. And then my dad, had pa he passed when I was 72. And mum a lot younger. And um, I decided to go for it. And they said, the job you're doing, managing liver probe, lots of pressure. So I went for it. But I had, if I had my time again, I wouldn't, I, would, I don't, I think I could have pushed it back. And it's like with any, any disease, any treatments have just got better and better and better. So today, I would have had stents put in rather than being cut mm. open. Mm. You can move on, that's boring stuff. That's no, I mean, it's, it's interesting. And by the way, I, there was a few people gasped when I asked about the mortality question. I certainly didn't mean to cause offence. I think about my mortality, I suspect lots of people do, so I was just curious, when you hit a landmark age, does it prompt? Uh, a thought like that, so uh, there was certainly no offence intended. No, at no, all. no, I didn't, I, I didn't, no offence taken. I, I just, I'm excited since um, since we announced on Sunday that I was finishing at Sky. I've, I've had some, I've had two really interesting offers since then. Keys and grey. <laughs> no, and I was the other one to come here tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, one related to more TV work, and one possibility of getting back into the game. So I'm quite. It's nice, it tickles your fancy when you, you know, you're, you're 70 and people still want you. Did you get offered the Leeds job? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's, a, that's a brave move. You don't really want to get back involved in the game. Day to day, oh, no, not management. No, no, I, I worked out 
15, 16 years ago, I don't have the personality to deal with modern players. I, no, I, f I fucking don't. I, I know I don't. It's like, you know, I, I believe that today the tail wags the dog. I believe you're boss in name only. The players, since they went on to the, the kind of money they get, has given them an independence that gives them a, a belief that they're far better than actually think they are because they earn 100 grand a week. Uh, and that's the shit players, by the way, 100 grand a week. So I, I, wor I worked out that I'm not someone that can just, if I'm not happy with something, I just can't walk away and say, oh, let it go. If I see something, I'm on it. Like if, I'm, if I feel someone's shot changed me, I've got to see it. And you can't do that today. You've just got to let everything go over your head and hope that they wake up the following morning in a better mood and try a bit harder in training. And you're sitting, and I really believe this, I think they're all fucking managers today or something like that on a Saturday afternoon. What am I going to get today? It shouldn't be like that. You know, I, I passion, aggression, determination should be a given. It's not something you, and I referred to this on Sunday on the, the Spurs-Liverpool game, talking about the Spurs team. It's not a switch. Mm. These things are not, you can't just switch them on and off. It's, it's, it should be with you from the first day of pre-season to the fucking last kick of the ball and the last game of the season. And did, and you, did you find at Premier League level, even in your time towards the end, that there were lots of bad pros? They didn't care. It wasn't all important to them. And, and I, I decided that the good times were not compensating for the bad times. And, and, I, and I was following up with, not all of them, but I was following up with a lot of players, um, just simply because they weren't, they weren't giving me everything. Okay. And what would the reaction, if you, after a game or after training, singled someone out and said, you're not pulling your weight, I, you end up, and I know we've certainly had a sea change in terms of how people manage now, but I was brought up in an environment, it was a hard school where if the manager has something to say to you, he said it to you in front of the group. It wasn't to embarrass you, it was just, we're all in this together, this is how it is. Now they're off and they're, they get their agents in, and maybe the fucking psychologist in, and I'm going to give you bad news, do you want to sit down? Can I get a cushion for you? Do you want your... It's, it's, you know, I, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's an impossible job today. Being a manager today is an impossible job today. The rewards are enormous, and it's not an easy, it's never been hard, it's never been more difficult than it is today, mm. given that, you know, we, we, um, the times we live in and where people are extremely precious. Not, all, not everyone, but people are precious today. Fuck them. Get on with it. <laughs> Deal with it. Deal with the bad news. Take a bit of criticism. Take someone pointing at you say, I thought you were shit today. Don't be like that next week. Oh, I'm off to HR. Or I'm going to speak to my agent. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, I know I'm talking like an old man, but I really believe we're on, a, we're on a spiral. I really do. I think we've got a... You know, I, I watch football today. And I'm, I'm biting my tongue. Say that again, Fernandez. I'll get to him if you want. He's... He, He's a really good player with a large question mark. Talented boy, but with a large question mark. But I, I, just, I just worry about, you know, players, they call it simulation. Have you ever looked what simulation is in the dictionary? It's deceit. So the pretty, you know, the pretty term, the, oh, that was simulation. How about calling it, no, he was fucking cheating. I mean, well, they get away with murder today. Mm. I just, every player, and you saw it exaggerated in COVID, when they get challenged, and there's no one in the stadium, so you can hear everything. They get challenged. They scream as they're going down. They roll over several times. All the teammates are putting their arms up, and the referee's going, that must be a bad one. No, it's not. It's simulation. Oh, sorry, it's cheating. I just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I love football, but I worry, I'm on a rant now, but I worry for football. <laughs> I worry for football, because you'll get fed up watching it eventually. What do you think was the sweet spot? What was the best decade? Well, I, I think the one, the one I played in. Because, <laughs> no, because in terms of we got good money, we didn't get great money. Here's an example. 19, my last year at Liverpool, um, 1984, we won the European Cup, the League Cup in the league. And Kenny Douglish and I would have been the best played players in the country. That year, I got 125 grand that year, which equated to 12 times the average man's wage. 12 times the average man's wage. 
and we won those trophies and we were the best team around. If you're a top player today, you're getting 600 times the average man, 600 times the average man's wage. That's how it's changed. And you don't have to be fucking winning too much to get that either. Hmm. In fact, you don't have to win anything. So that, now I don't know if I was playing today, if I'd be one of those pamper pooches where, you know, I screamed every time someone kicked me. Do you not think it's I'm good that the money's going back to the players? Like you talked to John Giles at the time of how maximum it going back wage. going to the players? Well, the, in their wages, oh. that actually the money that's coming in from Sky, from broadcasters, the money that's going into clubs, that it's better off going to the talent than the Glazers ripping it out of the club. See, I, 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 would, I would talk about the Glazers if you want. I mean, I, 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 mean I, I really don't get all the criticism they get. I really don't. I know there's a lot of Man United supporters. I'll give you my opinion, and I know it won't register with you, but the, the bot... You don't, no one came along and gifted them Man United. They had to put something up as collateral to get money from the bank to buy Man United. Now they bought it for, was it 600, 700 million? 700 million. So it's now worth, let's call it 5 billion. So they've been taking, it was a commercial deal. They're not football people. Like the Americans that, the fund that owns Chelsea. The other Americans, that, the Americans are hard-nosed businessmen that come here and see growth in our football. So the Glazers were paying themselves a, a dividend, 30 million quid a year. And people kept talking about the debt. If you've got a cash cow like Man United is, producing the biggest football club in the world, producing all this money that can easily pay off the debt, and the asset is growing, and it's gone from 700 million to, to 5 billion. And that's a business deal. They had to put up whether it was a shopping mall or several shopping malls or money or both to borrow the money to buy Man United. They risked something. So it was a commercial deal. They saw an opportunity and they went for it. And if it had gone pear shape, they would have lost all that. But it didn't. It's gone really well for them. So it was a smart deal. So then pay themselves a dividend. The asset grows. They've spent more money on transfers than anybody else. So how are the bad owners? If you look at the stadium, the lack of investment. Right? You look at the vast lack of investment in the stadium. Oh, fucking hell. How, who in this room is interested in Man United being the best stadium in the world? I think if you're paying a hundred quid tickets. When, when Fergie was winning all the trophies, when he was winning all the trophies, the Glaciers weren't getting the same criticism. It was the same story. The only difference you had, you had Ed Woodward take over thinking, um, this job's easy, I can do what Gil did and Ferguson did. And he found it very difficult and he made a pig's ear of it. And the most important thing at any football club any football club before, now, in the future is recruitment. They allowed a non-footballing person to make big football decisions, and that's why Man United have had a, disappoint, a disappointing decade because of the wrong people making football decisions, not because of the Glaziers. They made funds available. And as a manager, that's all you want, funds available to buy the best players, and they had the wrong people making the decisions. Mm. That's my take, but I'm, a, I'm seen as a Liverpool biased. <laughs> No, I, I, I take the point. At the same time, I suppose, the anger, without speaking for Manchester United fans, is that the club was debt-free. and suddenly, It was never debt-free. Well, effectively, in comparison with what the Glazers but, saddled on it. So suddenly a lot of money was being paid on interest rate to banks. Another bunch of money was but, going to people who just didn't care that much about it. But they've the spent more money than anybody else. Everyone's they have. complaining but, about but, Man City. But Manchester United are effectively the highest grossing club in world football because of their fan base. So they're always going to have money to spend. A whole chunk of it went to these lads over in America who didn't run the club very well post Fergie, didn't really care about the club. I just and, and appoint, I, appointed the I, wrong people and just slept at the wheel a little bit and I, I, they've made off with a chunk of change. So you can I see think people Ed Woodward off the hook. I don't see any argument But, but, against who, but who's, who's, you, you have who, to who allowed Ed Woodward to do the job for far too long? You have to, well, that's where the criticism is. They didn't see that he wasn't doing a very good job. But Man United are a monster football club. A monster of a football club. Yeah, but that's not down to the Glazers. And no. So they, they took they, a chance. It was a commercial deal. I'll come back to sure. Americans are hard-nosed businessmen. Yeah. The ones who bought Premier League teams. They're not in there. When they buy it, they're talking about their exit route. Mm. We'll buy it, we'll keep it six years, maybe ten years, and we'll get out. And that's what they did. I know, and football fans And in the early period, they were so successful with yeah. Fergie. Yeah, I take that point. Football fans aren't as used to that kind of a purchase. Glazers really pioneered. Well, I think it's, it's big business now is taking over the Premier League. Yeah. Man United are not alone. Mm. And I just I think it's down to, as I've said, the most important thing is recruitment. They, had it, they got it wrong for a good decade. 
And they'll, they'll be back. They'll, be, they'll, they'll come back again. Man United, you know, when I was a player, they got, they got relegated. Um, but look how they come back. Man United will be there forever. Mm. I think uh, the last time you were on Off the Ball with us was the day after Jack Charlton passed away, mm. uh, who was your manager at Middlesbrough when you were starting out. What age were you when you first met him? I think it would have been 20, 20, 21, 20. Yeah. Uh, Giles would always say he could never he'd win do an well, argument. He'd do well in mud one day, wouldn't <laughs> yeah. he? I think quite a few of that leads to him. Giles would always say you could never win an argument with Jack. You're going into that dressing room, probably a, quite a cocksure, 19, 20-year-old, plenty of confidence. Yeah. yeah. He basically said to me, he said, um, after a couple of weeks, he said, oh, I think you can play. I think you've got talent. He says, but you could be like lots of other kids who've had talent. He said, there's two doors for you. That one might take you to on to, on to being a, a player and maybe be lucky to win something. That one, you'd just be like lots of other talented kids who've just pissed it against the wall. Jack was black and white. There was no arm around the shoulder. It was fucking Jack's way or the highway. And, and um, he was the most unique character. I did like him. Yeah. The most unique character. Do you think he liked you? He did. He did. Why do I you say? I was, I was a rascal. I was full of mischief as a young <laughs> man. And we used to go to, it was, on a, it was a Tuesday night, a local nightclub in those days, you know, up north of England, these venues where they get big artists on. And it was called a fiesta. Jack was fucking in there more than I was. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was, he was, he was funny. I, I seem to remember, I, I was speaking to you the day after he passed away, and I always remember laughing. You were saying, you'd think twice if Jack offered you a lift. Uh, Jack used to have an old green Range Rover, and Jack was famous for his hunting and fishing. And if you got in the car with Jack, it was, it was, it was stinking of fish or <laughs> dead birds or both. And, and um, he... You just fucking wouldn't go. I'd rather walk. I was Hutton Road was old training ground. It was about five miles away. I'd rather walk than get back in a car with him. But he was, he was unique. He would turn up for training seldomly. I mean, seldomly. Right. And he'd turn up for match days half past two for a three o'clock kickoff. <laughs> wouldn't say anything. Just give you a bit of stick at halftime if it wasn't going well. What's seldom? Um... Most weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, he, he was never there. It was a, a guy called Jimmy Greenoff and, and Liam McFarlane used to do the training. Why, why did it work then? Because there are similar tales with Ireland of a certain laissez-faire. Players. Players. But in, I mean, when he was here in Ireland, he had the best group of players you've ever produced. True. And he got lucky. You know, international management is all about luck. You can't buy players. It's just what the country produces at that time. But, but Jack, is, it was basic. You know, it was like... Get it in there, we'll play in their half. And um, don't be showing me how clever you are in our own half. Mm. It was basic stuff. But it was, it was, it was born out of the, his time at Leeds and Don Revy and the success they had. Yeah. But they were, you know, if, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing or saying that Leeds weren't a great team. You know, Bremner and Gels in midfield, they were a real good foot. Eddie Gray, you know, Lauren were, they had great players, but they, were, they still had a, a basic way of playing, um, which of course enabled them to win trophies, mm. and they should have won the European Cup. If you remember that, yeah. Peter mm. Lorimer scoring a free kick, being made to take it again. Was it Bayern Munich? Yeah, and yeah. Holland. Yeah. So you know, Jack was a, a real character. I can remember, you know, you had the communal baths um, in those days, and I can remember Jack would sit in the bath. I said, you know, you better crack and. And I've got my shampoo and my conditioner and I've got the daft haircut. And I'm doing all this and I'm just... He said, I don't know why you fucking bother with that. He said, I've never used shampoo in my life. And he's got a lump of carbolic, car, carbolic soap. And he's doing this. <laughs> and, and I never had the bollocks to tell him that he had about six strands of hair on his head. <laughs> so, but he was, he was... He loved... It's like all managers, you know, it was his first job. And... Um, you still think you're a player, you still want to be around the players for the banter and the yeah. everything else that goes on. And he was, he was the most miserable, tight bastard I've ever met. <laughs> <football ever. laughs>
we'd be training, he'd be training, he'd walk over to the side where the old boy, you know, flat cap, retired. And this is when we're training, he walk over and go, I forgot my cigarettes, can I have one? And I swear on my children's lives, he would take the packet off the old guy, take three or four out, and give him the fucking packet back. <laughs> the guy's living on a pension, and he's this world cup winner. He was a unique character. He was. God bless him. Uh, when you go back to Anfield now with your sky work or to watch a game, I don't know, I guess you're there in the Well, it's not around the corner from me. I will go back. Yeah. Do, do you get a warm reception? I went, I went on the cop on Sunday just in case I don't go back. After the broadcast? In case I fucking die, like you said. I'm <laughs> well, just don't, don't, don't. Jesus, don't say that to me. <laughs> I won't sleep tonight, you know that. Yeah. Don't you? Oh, my God. In fairness, it turns out you're right. <laughs> I really did mean it in you're flying and you're going to be around for a long time. I think about my mortality, for God's sake. So what, you went out after the broadcast for... No, before the game. Before you know, the game, you get right. there before anyone's in the ground. So. Um, what are your memories that come to your mind when you go out there on your own? They were just the most unbelievably good days. You know, when I went to Liverpool, they had just won the European Cup. They were the team of didn't matter who had come in for me at that time. You know, if it had been Barcelona, Real Madrid, whoever, you would, you would go to Liverpool because Liverpool was the most successful team. And I went into a dressing room that was just full of winners. As I said, they just won the European Cup for the first time. And um, it was just great from day one. Mm. Just fantastic from day one. Hard school. And I never ever had a watershed moment in my career where any coach said something to me or showed something on the, on the training ground. I got better because every single day I was working with some of the best players in the world, think, having to think quicker and move the ball quicker, improving your touch. And um, it was just, it was a hard school, a very hard school, Ronnie Moran and Joe Fagan. Um, we were speaking to Wes before about Fergie and how very little he took part in actual training. That was Bob Paisley. It was more Ronnie, Ronnie Moran and Joe, were, they were with us all the time, but Ronnie, died, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And coming back from his funeral, I had my youngest son with me. And I said, you know what, James? Ronnie was the, easily the biggest influence on my career. And, and he had the incredible knack of making you feel you weren't very good. <laughs> no, <laughs> he, would say, he would say, ah, you think you're good players. We've had better players here than you lot. Ah, and you think you're a good player. And, you know, and he would throw a St. John in, or he would throw a Peter Thompson, or he would throw someone in. So they're always making you strive to be better. And obviously, looking back, we must have been as good as the other guys had had there. But it was, it was you know, team picture, second week of pre-season. You got an Anfield team picture. The manager would be in the middle. Joe would be there or Ronnie would be there. The other ones, and they would shout across to each other. Shit season last year, Ronnie, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the one trophy this year, Joe. And it's a fucking European Cup. It was a really bad season, <laughs> you know. So they were, they were on us all the time, on us all the time. To, and we were called the big heads, you know. And if we lost a the game, there was no big inquest. It was just a bunch of fucking big heads, a bunch of big heads. And they felt we were that good. The only time we lost a game is when we weren't at it. Okay. So you fucking big heads. You didn't show them respect, you're big heads. So we, I can remember we... We were playing Coventry one day, just to, on that theme. And we were 3-0 down at Coventry. And at halftime, Kenny and I, who were room, we roomed together, Kenny and I roomed together. And we were squaring up. And then it developed into, you know, try to land punches on each other and we were separated. And um, once it settled down, Joe said, well, it's fucking obvious to me. Ronnie said, well, it's fucking obvious to me. And the manager said, it's fucking obvious to me. They repeated this four or five times. And I said, tell us then, what's fucking obvious? You've all been on the piss. <laughs> they went into the bathroom area, drank the tea in there. The manager fucked off for a sausage roll and a sandwich in the boardroom. And we were left there doing... There was, no, there was nothing tactical about them. They just made us feel that if we matched anyone for effort, we'd win. Mm. And in my seven years at Liverpool, we did one thing tactically. We played Bayern Munich in a semi-final European Cup and 
were drawn nil nil at home. Paul Breitner played for them. He was a top, top player. And in the second game in the Olympic Stadium, we go out, we warm up, we come back in. The buzzer goes for us to go out and play the game. We line up, and the manager stood in front of us and said, oh, tonight, Sammy, Sammy Lee, you man mark that Paul Breitner. We all started laughing. What? Because in my seven years, that was the one and only time that talked about doing something different wow. other than us going out and being better in opposition. And you tell me the psychology in that. They've had two weeks to tell us, two weeks to work on it, and they chose to tell us two minutes before we go out. So they either had great belief in us that we would get it and could do it, or they weren't quite sure how to set up a, <laughs> a training to have a Paul Breitner lookalike. It was, it was, and, and, and that's all they did with us. They just made us feel that we were so good that if we match the other team for effort, you'll win. One of the things that stands out when you look at your stats from Liverpool is how many games you played. So every single season mm -hmm. you were there, you played over 50 matches. You spoke there about getting better and quicker and technically getting better. When you look back in those seasons, when were you at your absolute best? If we had analysis like we had now, where after every game, we're sitting down and we're debating Graeme Souness' talents. When were you, as a footballer, at your absolute best? I think my last year at Liverpool, when I was 30-31. You know, every position is different. Strikers would, wouldn't be the best at that age. But, you know, a central midfield player, you've understood the game and you've still got your athleticism. Um, I would say then, 30-31. You know, when you get older, if you're a striker, you start to come towards the ball. You don't want to be running in there all the time, unless you're Haaland. He'll be doing that at 41. Um, so, yeah, 31. You know the way you say there wasn't a big emphasis on tactics? Would you, as a group of players, discuss tactics as in, you need to drop deep on him, or that forward's dropping into midfield, Graham, you need to take him, or did you even... Did, did you even have to talk that way? Because surely there must have been some machinations well, going there on. Nothing, there was nothing as a collective. Okay. Joe was, was the one that would have, Joe Fagan was the one who, he was such a nice man. He's the one that would have given us direction if that was happening. Now, when I say they didn't talk tactics, I mean, he'd put big games, especially big games away in Europe, he would say to me, no, you'll have a good look today, son, won't you? And that meant, I would just support everything. I would never go and try and get in front okay. of the ball. Now, I, he must have gone around others in the team with their little bit of information. But that was my, now you'll have a good look today, son, won't you? And I knew what that meant. So that was his tactical to got. We never did training, set up training, because we are playing a certain team. Mm. Uh, we, 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 Melwood is the training ground then. There was a massage bench, you know, the one that had a back that lifted up. And it's strange, because the name you don't hear, but... Where's this guy that's with him tonight? It's called Eli. And Eli was a groundsman at Melwood. And he used to stagger in with an old Sabutio board about three foot wide, five foot high, put it on this, this bench and put out 4 4 2, a white team and a red team. We were always the red team. And the manager, we'd sit in an L shape around the bed. Every Friday morning, he would stand there and attempt to speak to us. Not once in my seven years did he refer to the Sabutio by pushing things around. The highlight of the Friday morning was that Kenny would bring in, Kenny Elgish would bring in the jock biscuits, which were the chocolate digestive, <laughs> and, and there was the English uh, biscuits, which were just the plain digestive. And if any of the fucking Englishmen went for that, there would have been, a, would have been <laughs> blows exchanged. <laughs> so we would sit there with our chocolate biscuits, and, but it was... It was um, Never referred to, never referred to. I can't, see when I talk about it now and, you, and I listen to all the bollocks that I hear on television, <laughs> you, you, people wouldn't believe me. They wouldn't believe us. That's how simple it was. And, and we dominated European football by having that attitude and that we are living and training. And, and players, you know, my last job at Newcastle, I had Kieran Dyer and Craig Bellamy. Ah, it was fucking different when you played. It was they just lost slow, they weren't as fit. It's strange that, and I've all, maybe you can answer this question. We obviously weren't living like you boys live now, and all the benefits of you know sports science, but we were playing against teams who did have all that. You know, the Spanish, the Italians, the Germans, the French, we're all doing what you were doing, but we used to piss all over them. Can you tell me why that was the case? I said, I'll tell you why, because we're fucking better players. <laughs> End of.
And they didn't warm to that, no? <laughs> no, no, no. I wonder why. You see why I didn't, I didn't want to be back in management? <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. Um, you're going to come back to, for us uh, later on, and we're going to chat a bit more football, which we're looking forward to, with the Man United boys. Uh, so for the time being, would you give a warm round of applause, please? Delighted he's here. Mr. Graeme Soonest, everybody. Thank you. Well, yeah.